set of word problems that I've cut from our text. Uh, it is easy for us to jump into a word problem and to say, all right, let me let me start working it. Let me try and figure out what's going on here. But I want to remind you guys that a method to our word problems, correct? We got a word problem. It's a solving five step approach that we like to take, right? Figure out what they're asking, assign a variable, write an equation, solve an equation, answer a question, uh, answer the question. So as we look at some of these examples today, I want us to try and do just that. All right, let's look at number one. This first one here. It says the product of two consecutive odd integers is one less than three times their sum. Find the integers. Now this is a classic algebra one question. When we talk about consecutive, uh, George, what does consecutive mean? That would be ascending. Uh, and consecutive numbers are in ascending order. We could be a little bit more specific, Quentin. All right, so they they appear right next to each other. Consecutive means one right after the other, right? So like if uh, I think I always use the example of uh, consecutive games started in uh, Major League Baseball. The record is held by whom? Cal Ripken Jr. Very good. The Iron Horse, right? One right after the other. Now these are consecutive odd integers. So if I had consecutive odd integers, that would be like seven, nine, eleven. So it's one odd number, and then the very next one in ascending order, and then the very next one. So how do we approach this if we don't know what those integers are? What do we generally speaking use in algebra if we don't know what an integer, or if we don't know what something is? A variable, good. So remember the trick is to say, I'm gonna let X be my first variable, okay? So I'm gonna say let X equal the first integer. Now, how would I go about uh, Tiago expressing the very next odd integer after X? How do I get from one odd number to the next odd number? Very good, X plus two, all right? X plus two equals the second integer, okay? Now it says that, by the way, did you, did you notice that we're following our steps? We've completed the first two steps. We figured out what they're asking. They're asking about integers. We assigned a variable uh, to our unknowns, and now it says uh, that the product, okay, product means multiply. All right, so the product of these two is, is means, equals so we got x times x plus two equals and then it says one less than does that mean one minus or does that mean something minus one something minus one what's one less than my height that's my height minus one what's one less than my age that's my age minus one so one less than something means something minus one and it says three times their sum and the sum of course means what Add. So we got X plus X plus two. So that's step three. That's our equation. That's the hardest step. Translating from English into math here. We've written out that third step. We've written out our equation. Now I did have to kind of shoehorn that in over there on the right hand side. Let me give myself a little bit more room. <clears throat> and there it is. All right. So it says the product is one less than three times the sum. Now, what kind of equation, Joey, do we have on our hands? What kind of equation is that in green? Remember how to qualify an equation, Jack? Can you know? Well, if I were to put it into standard form, remember where zeros on one side and everything else is already combined, distributed, like terms, all that, that's how I could better answer that question. So let's do that. Let's distribute X. So we got X squared plus 2X. Let's distribute uh, after we combine like terms. So that's going to be 2X plus 2. Distribute the 3 in there and we get 6X. plus six minus one. Uh, so let's subtract six X from both sides. So we get X squared minus four X. And I'll tell you what, we'll just do the next step in, uh, in the same breath. Six minus one is five. Let's subtract five from both sides. Now I'm gonna go back to Joey. Joey, what kind of equation is that? 
Yeah, very good. So did you notice the hesitation that we have at the beginning of the green equation to, to, to state or to kind of classify what that is? And then once we have put it in a nice recognizable form, now we're back on comfortable ground where we're like, okay, I can solve quadratics, right? We've got four techniques that we've learned for solving quadratics. Nate, name one of them. All right, that's a very specific example of factoring. Factoring in the ZPP is one technique. They don't always factor um, using one particular method, but factoring in general, factoring in the ZPP. Okay, so that's one technique. Luke, completing the square and the, and the uh, uh, square root method, that's another one. Grove, graphing. graphing, that's another one. Ben, and the quadratic formula. Fabulous. And we've been practicing as of late, right, getting used to using uh, at least one, if not more than one, of those techniques to solve. Now, for my money, this one, I know how I'm going to solve it. Okay, Mossy, how do you want to solve it? You want to use the magic method, huh? What, in general, is the magic method a method of doing? Factoring, factoring very good. So let's say I, well, we want to factor this. I wouldn't use the magic method. Magic method is not appropriate here because we've got a quadratic coefficient of one. But you're right to say, hey, let's let's factor. Factoring is faster than, let's say, using completing the square or or graphing or the quadratic formula. OK. And in fact, I bet some of you alpha dogs <laughs> have already got this factored. Lewis, you got this factored already? Alpha dog status unlocked. X plus one. Therefore, x equals what? 5 or x equals negative 1. Now, what do we always need to be on the lookout for? Extraneous solutions, right? So I've now, I've, that we just did step 4 in green, right? We solved the equation. Step 5 of our process, remember, is to check your answer. Make sure that you have answered their question. I had a real tricky ACT question I'm about to show you in a minute that I gave to my, my freshman, and they totally botched it because they didn't do their last final fifth step. OK, uh, but let's see here. It's the product of two consecutive odd integers. All right, so let's pretend like five is my first odd integer. What would my next odd integer be? All right, so five and seven. Let's test this out. What's the product of five and seven? Thirty five. And we want to see, is that one less than three times their sum? The sum of five and seven is. Thank you. All right, so does 36 minus one equal 35? You bet your biscuits it does. So five gets our stamp of approval. OK, and that was super simple. Right, I didn't do a much hardcore arithmetic on that at all. Let's try the next one. OK. Uh, the next one being what? Negative one. OK, um, the product of two consecutive odd integers. So product, what would the very next odd integer be after negative one? One. one. It's good. The product of negative one times one is negative one. And we want to see, does that equal one less than three times their sum? Well, what's the sum of negative one and one? Is that a true statement? It certainly is. Three times zero, zero minus one is negative one. So both of those answers check out and we would say, hey. Um, actually, that'd be a poor way of answering the question. I shouldn't say it that way. I should say, hey, my answer is five and seven. Or another way of answering this question would be negative one and one. So like there's a couple of ways of, of getting this job done for number one. And is that OK? Is it OK for a word problem to have multiple uh, possible solutions? Yeah, that's great. One day you're going to grow up and you're going to get a job and maybe your boss will come to you and say, I've got a problem. Drew, I've got a problem. I need your help with, please. Solve this problem for me, Drew. I'll be back tomorrow. And and tomorrow comes and Drew goes to his boss and says, hey, boss, man, I solved your problem. And in fact, you know, there's more than one option for you to choose. You get to pick. Do you want this solution or do you want that solution? Both of them will work. It's your choice. That boss is going to be like, oh, dude, Drew is awesome. Because not only did he solve my problem, but he solved my problem in multiple ways and he gave me the options. OK, so like, let's say, for example, 
that I threw in an extra stipulation on number one. Instead of saying the product of two consecutive odd integers, uh, I said the product of two consecutive uh, positive odd integers. Then I throw this out as an extraneous solution because negative one isn't positive. All right, you guys see what I mean by that? All right, um, actually, I want to show you an ACT question real quick. What's the best way of doing that? All right, hold your horses. I'm going to pull it up. Um, every week, my freshman practice, um, I give them an ACT uh, five question, little algebra. Uh, it's like pre-algebra and algebra one questions from the ACT. Every week they have five of them that they do as like a little quiz. And uh, I want to show you one from this week. Good night, America. OK, can I search? I can search. What number were we at? 27. I think that's it. Come on, computer. What the don't? Why did it? <clears throat> OK, see, I knew this wouldn't work. Damn, got it. All right, y'all, hold on. Hold your horses. We're going to find it. There's 24. There's 25. There's 26. Ah, there's 27. Beautiful. OK. So. Pull this over here. And then I'm going to click on this. Oh, I needed 26. That's what it was. OK, good, 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 good. 26. I just thought of this on the fly here, so that's why I'm having to pull it up in real time. All right, now we're cooking. Now we're cooking. Here we go. Number three is what we want. All right, y'all work out number three. Let's see if I can zoom in on this. Might not be able to. Now this one's going to be easier and quicker than what you and I just worked on, right? Uh, but you figure it out quietly. You don't don't blur out the answers. You figure it out. I'll give you um, I'll give you forty five four seconds. Typically, when you guys are a little bit older and you take your ACT, there will be sixty math questions, and you'll have sixty minutes. And so the novice would think, oh, 60 questions in 60 minutes, that's one minute per question. And that would be true if all the questions were of the same difficulty. Uh, however, the ACT sort of scaffolds itself to where like the first 20 questions are really easy, and therefore you should not take a minute on each of them. The middle 20 questions, they're kind of middle of the road. You probably would end up taking about a minute per question on there. And then the last 20 questions are a little bit harder, uh, and therefore probably require a little bit more than a minute per question. So. If you if you spend a minute here and a minute here, then you're going to run out of time on the hard ones. But if you spend like, you know, less time on the easy ones, this will be like considered an easy one. OK, uh, so you would definitely want to be able to do it in less than a minute. All right, um, let's see here. How many people chose 109? How many people chose 112? How many people chose 117? How many chose 118? How many chose none of these? Ooh, that's the most popular. Why is none of these correct? Because 117 is not even. And that's what got everybody, uh, my freshies, as, as far as they're concerned. Like they all, and, and hey, hey, look, uh, 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 full disclaimer, right? When I was making my answer key, I dadgum selected this one as the correct option. Why is it so tempting to do that? Because it's divisible by nine, but you have to do what? She got to read the whole question. And so, um, you know, if we overlook that little uh, initial thing about, oh, this number has to be even, uh, 117 obviously is not even, so we would throw it out, all right? All right, so anyway, just a little look, like I said, at, uh, at an example where that fifth step of a word problem solving method is, is uh, you know, as my seven-year-old would say, is totes important, okay? Now, um, let's look at, let's see how I could best do this. Let's look at number two. Okay. Now I like number two because number two is a picture problem. Joey. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. 
There we go. Uh, number two is a picture problem. I like that. Anytime I can draw a picture, anytime I can get my sort of get my hands in there and work with something, visualize something, I feel like it's an easier uh, kind of setup. So it says the length of a rectangle exceeds. What does exceeds mean? It's more than, right? It's, so a length of a rectangle is more than uh, the width by three inches. So let's stop right there. I'm going to draw a rectangle. Okay, so here is a rectangle. Now, if I've got an unknown width and length, the temptation will be to say let W be the width and let L be the length, right? But we don't necessarily always want to try to express things with two variables. If we can easily express it with one variable, that's much better. So why don't I say let uh, W be my width? How would you therefore substitute in for the length? W plus three. Now, I don't know about you, but the picture for me makes that a whole heck of a lot easier. Because I see that the length is longer, is more than. I would have to add to the smaller quantity. And I've always encouraged you guys, let your variable stand for the smaller quantity if you could. Now, now would it be possible? Could I have worked this out and saying this L and that's L minus three? Could we have done it that way? Yes. Of course, for supuesto. But why would I want to be uh, having some negatives up in there? I don't like negatives. I don't like them at all. All right, it says the area of a rectangle. Okay, so Alex Cano, formula for the area of a rectangle, please and thank you. Dude, you're fancy. You, you went and you went uh, ahead and, and distributed the W. I didn't know where you were going with that when you said W squared. Yeah, length times width, right? That's exactly what Alex just did. Length times width is my area. So as Alex just said, W times W plus three. Uh, so that's my area. And it says is, is means equals. And then we got 70. So there we go. And as Alex said, we distribute, we get W squared plus 3w, and then Alex uh, went, what do I want to do next to both sides? Why would I subtract 70? Yeah, so it's a quadratic equation right here, but I agree with Alex. It looks better when we put it in this sort of standardized form of I've got my quadratic term, and then my linear term, and then my constant term, and then we always have zero on the other side. <laughs> Now, the technique that Mossy used in the last example, he said, Coach Morgan, factor it. Okay, great. Does factoring work on this one? Yes. So why wouldn't we use it again? Go ahead and factor this out. Use the ZPP. Get your two answers, because this is a quadratic, right? Quadratic equations have how many solutions? Two solutions, and we want to check to see if either of them is extraneous. Reed, you got it factored? Fabulous. W plus 10 and W minus 7. Now, class, will everything always factor? No. If it doesn't factor, this is a little bit of a tougher question now. If it doesn't factor, um, we can still find the answers, right? Using one of those other methods that we've talked about, complete the square or quadratic formula, you know what I mean. But if it doesn't factor, what kind of answers are we going to be getting then? Irrational. I heard a couple of people say it. We're going to be getting, in other words, answers are going to have what in them? Radicals, right? Square roots. Uh, and so would it be okay to have a rectangle whose length and width are irrational numbers? Sure, man. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay. And so when we're going through these word problem applications, I don't want us to get into the habit. Like as exercises, they always work out nice and neat, right? Like W equals negative 10. By the way, what is that? Good, that's an extraneous solution. Or W equals seven. And so we say, oh, look, okay, this, this rectangle is seven by 10. 
And you say, yay, OK, good. So that that problem's not hard at all because uh, we threw this one out as being extraneous. Um, but I don't want you getting into the habit of thinking that every quadratic equation that you ever come across is always going to work out nice and neat because they won't. But that's OK. OK, uh, so very good. Quentin, question. You would say like it says uh, find its dimensions. So you would say its dimensions are seven. Uh, is does it even give inches? Yeah, seven inches by ten inches, something like that. You could say coach that rectangle seven by ten, something like that. <clears throat> Good question. Anybody else? Go for it, Lewis. Why is um, let's see. Bless you. This desk. Would I ever describe it as being? Hmm, yeah, that's about negative thirty inches across, right? So there are certain contexts that we we find negative numbers to be inappropriate in, like distances. I wouldn't say, Lewis, that I live negative 31 miles away from here. Um, and so we would we would throw that out as, as being extraneous. All right, I think we've got time for one more. Let's see if we can do one more. Angel wants to cut off. A square piece from the corner of a rectangular piece of wood. The larger piece of wood is a four by eight sheet of plywood, apparently. Okay, it's a standard sheet of plywood. And the cutoff part is a third of the total area of the plywood. Okay, now what's a third of the total area of that four by eight sheet? Come on, quick. What's a third of 32? A third of 32 is 14. No, nah, it's 32 over 3, 32 thirds. Is it OK to have fractions? Yeah, yeah. Heck yes, it is. OK, so again, here's a picture problem. So I'm going to draw myself a picture. There's my original four by eight sheet of plywood, and we're going to cut a square. That's too big. I'm going to cut a square. Yeah, I'll take that. That looks kind of 30 ish, I guess. Um, and it says find the length of the side of the square. So that's my unknown, isn't it? So as far as my unknown, why don't I just call that square an x by x square? So we got x here, and we got x there. Uh, this whole sheet was four by eight. Now, do you remember we talked earlier in the year about what I called the quote donut hole principle? Where we would, you know, the way that they make a donut, they take the dough and then they they pluck out the little donut hole and then they, you know, throw it in the fryer and they fry out the donut hole. But the donut is is the circle with the, the hole punched out of it, right? You guys remember that at all? Gosh, dog. I talked about Oakland Donut Shop. And, and how they always they get they, they always give us like a dozen free donut holes whenever we go in there. Uh, maybe I didn't tell you guys. Anyway, that's pretty much the story. <laughs> but the idea of the donut hole principle that I refer to is what operation are we using? Yeah, so subtraction. Like if you have a big circle and a little circle and you want to find the area of the donut, you subtract big circle minus little circle. Right? That's the same thing here. So if we want to figure out what X is um, and, and we're looking at, we're saying, oh, one third of that 32, get out of here, reminder, is my area of the square. You know, that's that idea of this is the big one. Let me multiply it by a third. Okay. Uh, and that will equal the the little one. OK, uh, again, what kind of uh, what kind of equation are we looking at here? Good. And how many solutions does every quadratic equation have? It has two solutions. I know I sound like a broken record. I'm trying to get you guys uh, to muscle memory, right? We're, we're working that in. So now in this case, I told you guys a moment ago, 32 thirds. It's OK to deal with that in terms of a fraction, but now what do I do to both sides to get X by itself? Good. 
square root method is totally appropriate in a quadratic equation that looks like this. Because now, whatever I do on the right, I do on the left. Now, I've taught you guys a couple of little um, factoids about this. Okay, number one, what is the square root of x squared? X. Tiago's got it. The absolute value of x. Which we skip over this little intermediate step, right? So like if I had x squared equals 25, we always just jump to what? Somebody said it over here a second ago. Plus or minus. We skip over that intermediate step because we're tired. I, I told you guys, I'm, I'm like, dude, I don't want to sit here and write plus or minus 5 every day I'm time. Uh, or excuse me, uh, absolute value of x every day I'm time. I'm going to switch to plus or minus 5. So, but the reason being is that when we take the square root of uh, x squared, it's absolute value of x. In class, what's the square root of 25? Don't say plus or minus 5. The square root of 25 is? No, 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 just 5. Just 5. The square root is always a non-negative number. And then when we say mm, absolute value equals 5, that's where we get our plus or minus. Because that equation is saying, hey, x is a number that's 5 spots away from 0 on a number line. You can go 5 to the right or you can go 5 to the left. Okay. Uh, now, this was a little side example, so I'm going to get rid of it. But the idea is that over here in my legit example, now that I've taken the square root of both sides, I'm going to skip that step. And I'm going to say X on the right. And what am I going to have to put on the left? A plus or minus. Now, how do we take the square root of a fraction? Jack McVee. Good. Square root of the top. And square root of the bottom. Now, there's a couple of issues that we need to deal with. Joe Edwards, can you name one of them? There's a couple of things I need to do here. What, what's one of the things I need to do? So 32 is not a perfect square, but, Drew? Pardon? OK, we'll deal with that in a second. That's the second issue. So we'll get to that in a second. I, I want to talk about what he said. Uh, James, you got a hand up. 32 is not a perfect square. Does it have a perfect square factor hiding in it? Your name, James. It's Lewis. You silly goober. Uh, James, what do you think? 16. 16, yeah. <laughs> All right, so square root of 32 is what? Four square root of two. The reason being is we could say, oh, that's square root of 16 times two. That's the square root of 16 times the square root of two. That's four times the square root of two. And we do all of this processing where? We do that in our head. If you want to write it out, you can, but save yourself a little bit of time. All right, so we got x equals plus or minus four square root of two over square root of three. Now Drew Benton has said correctly for our second and final act of this. Uh, problem here. We've got to get rid of the radical in the denominator. What's that process called, Paul? Very good. That's the, the thing that we want to do. The process called rationalizing the denominator. Whenever you need to rationalize the denominator, do what my man Paul just suggested. We're going to multiply by a clever form of one. In class, in this case, what is that clever form of one? Square root of three over itself. Square root of three over square root of three. We multiply the top with the top and the bottom with the bottom, and we wind up with x equals plus or minus 4 square root of 6 all over 3. Now, that was step 4 of our, of our word problem. What is the fifth and final step here? Answer the question. And the question said, what is the length of the side of the square? And if I've got x equals negative 4 square root of 6 over 3, why is that a bad answer? Because that would be like saying this desk is, is negative 30 inches across. We don't say the distances are negative. So we would say that that square has a length of positive 4 square root of 6 over 3 inches uh, in length. Or feet in length, I should say. All right. Now, we worked three quadratic word problems over this class period. Well done, indeed. We will look at um, we'll look at a couple more on Monday when you guys get back. All right. So have yourselves a fantastic weekend. Uh, be safe and get some rest. Live Jesus in our hearts. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. Hope you all have a great day.